Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben, and today we are looking at this review copy I was sent of Stars Without Number by Kevin Crawford. So this is the revised edition that was kickstarted recently, and this is the print-on-demand um, version of it from Drive Through RPG. Now I have reviewed a book by Kevin Crawford before. I have looked at Godbound. I'll put a link to it right up here if you want to check that out. And this is in a similar vein. Kevin Crawford has become fairly famous in the OSR and just RPG circles in general um, due to his commitment to sandbox gaming. There's lots of role-playing games out there that tell you you can have a big open world and let players do what they want, but there are very few games that are as committed through and through to providing you with the tools necessary to make that easy. And just like in Godbound, Stars Without Number really delivers on that front. Let's take a quick look at the back cover. Not a lot on here, it's just an open star field. It has a very minimalist design all the way through it, and that goes uh, through the art as well, which I will talk about as we come to it. So this is an OSR game in the sense that it uses the stats and the basic rule structure of old school D&D. However, it streamlines and modernizes it um, to the point where it's much more rationalized and much easier for new people to pick up. The layout and design of the book is quite straightforward. It's a two column layout, um, just black text on a white background, and it's very, very functional. And that's gonna be a theme that we're gonna see throughout the whole book, is its functionality and its, its non-flashiness. While I was thinking about this book, I was trying to put into words um, the vibe that you get from reading this book. And that is, Kevin Crawford is sort of the anti-auteur of the RPG scene. There's a lot of big names in the RPG scene that thrive off of their name recognition and their unique style, but Kevin Crawford really tends to hide in the background where he really takes himself out of the equation and he just gives you tools, highly refined tools that make things much, much easier for you. He's not about making a name for himself, he's just about making things easy. And that is really remarkable and it's very unusual in this scene. And I think he really should be applauded for it. So let's start off with character creation. Now, the art in this is interesting in the sense that it's often uh, very technically well done, but by and large, it doesn't give me a very distinct impression of one particular setting. It's fairly generic. And I think I understand why that is. Um, there is a default setting built into this, but um, it's, it's fairly generic. And the idea is that you can adapt it very easily to whatever science fiction setting that you have. Uh, as I said before, his goal really is to make things easy for you and weighing things down with a very particular setting would work against that. Another great thing that we saw in Godbound and which we also see here is that the attention to layout is very prevalent across the entire book. Almost everything is designed to fit exactly onto one page or onto a two page spread. It's very rare for any information to flow from one page onto a back page, meaning that everything is very compact and easy to reference. Uh, that's an attention to detail that is very rare. Uh, we do see it a lot in Lamentations of the Flame Princess books, but in mainstream um, RPG books, it's almost unheard of. So we have an actual picture of the character sheet here, and then we have a quick walkthrough exactly how you fill out each part of it, right? That's fantastic. All you need is these two pages, and you can walk your players through character creation without having to flip very much throughout the book at all. You may have to reference some library material further on, but it's all right here. We have your basic attributes, nothing too surprising about that. We have skills, which work on a D6 system rather than on a D20 system. There's a wide variety of skills that you can choose from, along with psychic skills, because there's three main classes. You have essentially your warrior, your thief, and your wizard, but they're reframed in sci-fi terms, where your wizard is a psychic with a wide variety of psychic powers. Uh, we have backgrounds that you can choose from, and we have a system for creating um, backgrounds for your character based on the skills that you choose. And just as, throughout the, as we see throughout the rest of this book, he gives you a number of different ways to do that. Do you want to just pick your skills and really craft something? Do you want to randomize it? Do you want a mix of the two? You have options for everything. Wide variety of possible backgrounds. We have a run through of your basic character classes, including how to create hybrid classes that are a little bit of different things. 
of a couple of different things. We have uh, focuses, which are essentially like feats. They're like little, con little uh, compact little powers that you can pick up when you level up that really differentiates your character mechanically and keeps them from being too bland. Snipers, tinkers, wanderers, starfarers, and so on. And we have equipment packages. What's really great is that, here we go, we have another two page spread that's just quick character creation. So it gives you a, a whole bunch of other ways that you can make characters if you wanna make things even faster from just picking up a standard array to a wide variety of other methods. We have our psionic section for all of the uh, psionic powers you can get for your wizard type characters that br are broken down into several different schools. Biopsionics, metapsionics, um, we have precognition, telekinesis, telepathy, teleportation, and that's it. Now we get into the actual systems of the, of the game. And if you've played any OSR game, this is going to be pretty straightforward. One nice thing that I saw that he did is in a lot of his previous books, from what I understand, and this was true in Godbound, is he does use a descending armor class system, um, but he rationalizes it and makes it fairly easy to use. However, in this system, we have ascending armor class. So things are even more easy to understand and will sync up very well with modern OSR systems. Basic rundown of how everything works. Like I said, nothing terribly surprising. It doesn't go on and on. It just gives you exactly what you need. We have a section on hacking, which is really great if you want to play a uh, hacker type character. How to do character advancement. There's a little bit here on experience points, um, but generally he leaves it up to you as to how you are going to run XP and what you're going to award it for. He gives you a chart down here of what he recommends where you get about three XP per uh, session. And that gives you a, a scale on which you go up um, to get other levels. But we read this a little bit further on and we'll get to that uh, where he talks about, do you want to do it by getting gold or credits, right? Is that going to be your XP? Is it going to be through um, just session based? Is it going to be through goal based? Is it going to be through fulfilling character motivations and, and quests? Lots of different possible options. Customize it to the way that you like to play. And this was also true in Godbound. This seems to be a thing that he likes to do. System quick reference sheet. We have one page with all of the basics of the rules. This means you can simply photocopy this page or just print it off of the PDF and you can give it to all your players and they will have an easy reference material right there in front of them. Equipment and vehicles. Now this is a sci-fi game, so there's gonna be a ton of stuff available for in equipments and vehicles. We talks about technology levels. You'll visit different planets that have a different level of technology, so that's gonna affect um, what they're able to do. We have our armor system. Wide variety of ranged weapons, melee weapons, and heavy weapons. Now, the way that he makes melee weapons actually relevant in science fiction combat is that they often have something called a shock value, which means that they often do damage even when they miss, even though it's it's a lower amount of damage. So there's a consistent damage output that you can get from melee weapons due to being up close, and that makes it a little bit more appealing. General equipment that you can get computing gear, pharmaceuticals. The vast majority of this book is library content. Like I said, the rules can be summarized on one page. The vast majority of it is just tools that you can use so that you don't have to make things up yourself. When we get into vehicles, things get a little bit interesting um, because you have drones, for example, and cyberware and so on. Uh, wait, maybe it's a little bit further on. We'll get to it in just a minute. But he has a system for constructing your own starships that I thought was really cool. I thought it was here, but I think it's actually a little bit further on. So hold on. We have artifacts, so crazy stuff from uh, the pre-tech era. So I'll talk really briefly about the kind of built-in setting here where we had this galaxy that was fleshed out with uh, lots of very powerful, advanced space-faring civilizations. Um, with a high level of technology. And then there was a galactic catastrophe where all of the jump gates, uh, more or less, were destroyed in something called the Scream that also fried a lot of the psychics. And as a result of that, uh, a lot of civilizations regressed to a uh, lower level of technology. 
So now that things have regained their footing enough that people are heading out into the stars and rediscovering all of these other planets, you can uncover bits of advanced technology that are way above what you know. And that's what artifacts are going to be. So this gives you a reason to explore and, and to delve into ruins. There's also a great um, bit of setting material where information uh, can't travel faster than light, although spaceships can. So that means that information is going to travel across the galaxy at the speed of a spaceship traveling at warp speed. So this gives you a very old west sort of feel where you're pushing onto the frontier and information is going to travel slowly. And you're going to have to do things like curry information and, um, and messages from place to place. That can even be a mission. We have uh, information and uh, rules for modding and building equipment. And here we go. This is what I was talking about. Starships. So we have starship hulls. So you can basically pick the type of hull that gives you an armor class, power, mass, and so on. And then you can start adding fittings onto it. So we have a huge variety of things you can cobble onto your spaceship to really customize it to be what you want it to be. To create that home away from home that your party lives in and uses to uh, travel about the galaxy. Right, wide variety of defenses that you can add, weaponry options, some example starships that you can simply steal straight up. Modifying and tuning your starships. Some rules for space travel. Rules for sensors and detection. And here we go for a section for space combat. So the way that he does space combat is he breaks the ship up into a number of major systems. So we have bridge, gunnery, engineering, comms, and the captain. So each of these has a separate role to take during combat. And this allows everyone to stay involved uh, during a, a space battle. There's a system for actions and command points where different um, people on the ship can give command points to other people to allow them to do more things. But there's also a simplified version of these rules where you can make things slicker if you don't want to track these uh, command points. One really interesting thing is that when you take a lot of damage, it's possible to have a ship crises instead of simply taking damage. And when a, when a crisis happens, it basically adds a narrative problem that you need to deal with. So rather than just taking a bunch of hit points worth of damage, you might have an engine lock, or you might start losing some cargo, or you might have a hull breach. So this means that the players on the ship are going to have to deal with these crises while having a space battle. I thought that was a really great twist, and that really adds a level of um, a cinematic, action-packed feel to it. Because that, that's what space battles feel like in movies, for the most part. If you ever played the game uh, FTL, Faster Than Light, you'll know what I'm talking about. This is a great way to simulate that sort of thing. We have a breakdown of his setting, the history of space. And we have one of the things that he's most famous for, which is his sector creation. So a sector is just a large um, section of space with a wide variety of planets. And then the game mostly takes place within that sector. Of course, in theory, you could move on to another sector, but a well fleshed out sector is going to provide enough, in enough uh, information and material for even years of gameplay. We have some basic um, advice. I love the way that he really talks to the game masters and tells them um, what they would should be thinking about as they are designing their sector. He talks about, am I having fun? Am I going to need this for the next session? Uh, overworking yourself as a game master can be a real problem, especially when you're building a sandbox. You feel like you have to flesh everything out. So keeping these two things in mind can prevent burnout and making sure that you are focusing on just the stuff that you need and not on a lot of extraneous material. There are so many random tables in here that a lot of the stuff can be randomly generated on the fly. And you don't actually have to put a ton of work into it. There are also uh, online tools, I believe. Uh, I, I've seen these before that randomly generate sectors um, just on their own. You can just use these websites to generate them for you. Though of course, you have all the information here if you want to. So world tags, there's 100 different world tags each of which has a variety of effects and, and effects that they're going to have on the planet and what uh, adventures there are going to be like. For example, there's an abandoned colony there, alien ruins, and so on. So each of these, each of these uh, tags are the different things that you're going to find there in general. And you can customize those as you see fit. Huge variety of them. You could randomly select them or just pick them to create your own worlds. Rules for the atmosphere of the planet, for the temperature, the biosphere. 
And again, notice how each of these topics takes up exactly two pages. It's almost funny once you start realizing it that he put that much work into it. From what I understand, he actually designs these books in InDesign, where he actually writes them in InDesign. Um, so he's not like writing a draft and then trying to fit it in. It's designed from the beginning to fit like this. I just love that about it. Points of interest in the system. Again, tons of random tables. Hopefully you can see this on the video. I know it's a little small. You should be able to get a sense of the amount of information that he gives you. Just as in Godbound, he gives you uh, tons of ways to ran randomly generate courts and factions and dungeons and so on. We see the same level of attention to detail here. Rewards that you can give people, creating problems. Now, this is a really essential factor for any sandbox game. Um, it's not so much creating worlds and spaceships that's often the problem, but be, uh, but being able to present players with a variety of different types of problems and adventures, right? If it's the same sort of thing over and over, that's not going to be interesting. But by entangling several of these random tables together, you can get adventures that are different every time and give them a new kind of problem to solve. And that's going to keep them engaged over the long term. Creating people. Now, what I really like about this NPC generator, essentially, is that it doesn't focus on a lot of the surface details. Instead, it has their initial manner. So you immediately know how to present the NPC and how to talk in their place. It has a default deal outcome. So what's going to happen when you follow through? Are they going to betray you? Are they going to do something else? What's their motivation in life? What do they want out of life? What is their power? So what makes them effective and a useful NPC? And what's their hook? So you don't need things like hair color and clothing types when you're designing NPCs. You need stuff like this, because this is the meat. This is what's under the surface that makes the adventure interesting. And he understands that, and he gives it to you. Creating places, same sort of thing. We have rewards, what's civilized there. We have wilderness uh, ongoings, um, hazards, specific examples of that, and possible dangers. Adventure seeds, you're having trouble rolling up all of this stuff. You need something on the fly. Here's a hundred adventure seeds. Here's a hundred ways to start a mission. I'm just going to roll them out for you. Just pick one randomly or take one and tailor it to whatever you want. And then he gives you a work through example of creating an adventure. We have a Xeno bestiary. We're dealing with aliens. Humanity. We have robots. We have player uh, robot player characters, if you want to do that sort of thing. How to create beasts. How to create aliens. How to make an alien player character. Factions. So faction is another thing that starts with a number has been famous for for a long time. It's a system neutral um, system for running factions in the background. So it's like a mini game, really. In between sessions, you can have all your factions worked out. And they have specific stats that are just relevant to factions. And in between sessions, you as the GM play a mini game where you figure out how they are interacting with one another. Are they pushing into each other's territory? Are they forming alliances? Are there new problems developing? So that when the next session begins, when the players investigate what's been going on in the world, they'll see that it has evolved like it's a real place. So we have um, turns, basically. There's a faction turn, which is that mini game I spoke of. And the actions that factions can take. Um, can take and buying and using assets, the goals of the factions. Faction tags, what sets them apart and makes them dangerous or useful. Some example factions, a walkthrough of what that looks like in play. And we have Game Master resources. Now, the Game Master resources in Godbound were some of the best that I've ever read in terms of breaking down the theory of game mastering to a very concrete and specific level that was easy to comprehend. There's not a lot of vague generalities about being a game master. Instead, we have specific advice. And that's really fantastic. Common game master complications. Look at this. The very first thing that it starts out with is here are problems that people run into while running this game. I haven't seen another book that, do, that does that. Maybe there are, but that is wonderful just to start things out that way, right? It's like a frequently asked questions, right? How to deal with the death of your characters, how to deal with skill checks, problems with combat, negotiation and diplomacy, areas that people often have trouble figuring out how to run effectively. 
and it just gives you advice right at the beginning. How to do interstellar trade. Now, I believe there are a lot of supplements for the first edition of Stars Without Number that expand on these things even more. For example, I believe there's a book called Sons of Gold that takes um, interstellar trade and makes it a whole thing, where if your players just want to become merchants and travel from star to star making money, there are rules for that. But everything is very modular, very you know, pop in and pop out, depending on what you need. Converting from first edition and just talking about house rules. So again, look at this. He has a whole bunch of things where he says, how do you like to play the game? Here's, if you like to play it this way, take this rule system out of Stars Without Number or put this one in or tweak things like this. There is not a sense of, I'm a genius who has created this uh, game system and you should play it my way. It's, it's a, an attitude of, this is your game. You're the game master. You have a responsibility to the people at your table to make it the best game possible. So you should tweak and change everything as much as you need to so that that is something that happens. Name generators. So we have a whole variety of cultures. So we have thousands of names here, depending on which culture you want um, the planet to be based on. A one roll NPC table, one roll patrons, where you can just roll a D6, 8, 10, 4, 12, and 20, right? A big handful of dice, and boom, it gives you everything you need for an NPC. Same thing for urban encounters and wilderness encounters, transhuman campaigns. So we're starting to get into some of the bonus material in the back here, um, where it's a lot of really interesting stuff, but isn't strictly necessary uh, to run the game. So if you want to really go with hard and soft singularities where the players can upload themselves to the internet and fight other AIs within the web, then and that's the thing you can do. What organic, shell, organic shells that you can download yourself into, mechanical shells, digital combat, transhuman polities. There's a lot of great just sci-fi stuff in here. Space magic. You want actual wizards in your space, in your uh, outer space adventures? Hey, you can do it with, with uh, ideas for how to take things like Labyrinth Lord and Lamentations of the Flame Princess spells and import them directly into Stars Without Number. Heroic characters, heroic character classes, heroic combat. We have a, uh, a character sheet here at the back. Ideas for artificial intelligences, how to create science fiction societies that are believable, but that don't wear you out as a GM and trying to create them. How to create the society's rulers and the classes that are ruled, flavoring the society. And we have a section on running mechs if you want mech combat in your sci-fi. And who doesn't really? So there we go. That was a very brief overview. I barely scratched the surface of it, but um, this book is enormous and incredibly useful. That's the refrain for all of Kevin Crawford's books. It's useful. And here's the big kicker. Just like Godbound, this book is free. Kevin Crawford puts all of his books out for free in PDF form. Um, all that it's missing is some of the extra little bonus material at the back of the book that I showed you. All of the core stuff, you know, 90% of the book is all there in the PDF, all fully fleshed out, it has everything, and it's free. You should download that immediately if you are ever going to run a science fiction game of any kind, really, because you can steal all of these tools and run them in almost any system because so much of it is system neutral. I'm strongly going to recommend Stars Without Number. If I ever run a sci-fi game, this is going to be my go-to. I'll put a link down in the description below where you can check it out on DriveThruRPG, where you can get the um, PDF or you can get this nice hard copy uh, print form. And I always like the hard copies for when I'm running things at the table. Well, that's it for this review. Thanks for watching, everyone. Um, please let me know if you know of any other great science fiction role-playing games in the OSR vein, because I may like to check those out at some point in the future. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you want to see more old school role-playing games like this one. And you can join me on Patreon if you want to support me making stuff like this. Thanks for watching, everyone. I'll see you guys later.